Greetings, adventurers. It is the holiday season, and many of us are patiently waiting and dreading the return of Krampus this Yuletide. But before he does, or doesn't return, if you leave treats in your shoes just beyond the door, we wanted to let you know about a show we've been enjoying lately called The Damage Guild Podcast. They're quite fun, and best of all, you can listen with your whole family while roasting something on an open fire. Here's a quick preview of their show before we return to the deep tunnels in this week's episode of Dark Dice. Hey everyone, my name is Brian Stout, one of the co-hosts of The Damage Guild, a real play 5th ed D&D podcast. Here at DGP, our goal is to create a fun, clean, family-oriented show. You can meet our characters like Tokus Alton, the brilliant but scatterbrained gnome fighter, our water-fearing Goliath ranger Shava, and his quick-witted badger animal companion Stripey, and Aslo Tendertoe the halfling bard who casts his spells by singing parodies of well-known modern-day songs. So if you enjoy jokes, adventure, killing things, and friendship, check out the Damage Guild podcast. You can find us at thedamageguild.com or wherever fine podcasts are available. The Damage Guild podcast. We deal the damage so you don't have to. We hope you'll check out the Damage Guild podcast, and last but not least, we wanted to mention something very quickly about this episode. You'll be hearing toward the end a very wonderful soundtrack called Devil's Gamble, which was created by Stephen Malin, myself, Enzo Pizzovio, Sam Bose Miller, and the Budapest Scoring Choir. That's right, there's a 40-person choir that will be singing in this episode praises to Loth in Icelandic. We hope you enjoy it, and that it brings a sinister smile to your face as the events unfold. Do you seek him? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago, a story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, the team set off from Ilmeter's Hope to find the town's missing children. Instead, something else found them. Having passed the second gate, can they enter the trials to come? Will the team's resolve hold up? Will odds roll in their favor? Fear the strangers in your midst. Never play games of fate. Dark Dice, Chapter 9, Tunnels. The team passed the second great gate, into the silent passage beyond. The dark, thirty-foot-wide hallway was lined with numerous large stones, and while the air was free of the rancid decay that had followed the party for the past few days, it was oddly moist and cold. Despite the chill, darkness, and feelings of unease, the hallway stretched beyond the party's field of vision as they shuffled through. The stones bore masterfully carved dwarven runes, incredibly small and detailed, covering the surface of the massive five-foot-tall stone blocks. The first five thousand feet of tunnels were lined with skeletons and small alcoves, erected into an eternal standing position, but the team silently moved onward. As they cautiously continued down the dark passage for the first hour, prepared for whatever horrors this place had to offer, they only found more of the same bare, yet sturdy stone walls, and evidence of the passage of countless centuries since its construction. We seem to have reached again some form of unhallowed ground. I cannot feel the presence of Peller in this place, and I suspect my abilities may be limited here. I recommend we all keep our eyes open for the silent. I feel that we're getting quite close to the Nameless God, and he soon might be out of his tricks and be forced into an open confrontation with us. The sounds of motion behind the team were briefly audible as the words, the silent one, were spoken. Um, perhaps we ought to give him another name, because that seems to be summoning. Let's, uh, just, let's call him S.O. So? Maybe T.S.O.? I stare into the dark towards the cheering sound I heard. Father Westpike gazed back into the darkness, sweat forming over one eyebrow from the heat of the torch. Whatever it is, it's keeping its distance, at least 60 feet. We should keep moving. 
Soren and Filgi led the party down the passage, eyes and weapons ready for any surprise. But a second hour of travel passed, and even Ayas began to ease up, if only a little. The plain featureless tunnels and the shifting light from Soren's torch began to wear on their focus, and their vigilance began to tire. They gradually began to feel the weight of the day's events, the loss of Sister Cavern's fall, and the remaining aches from the trap sprung. Hold up a minute, uh, I'm gonna leave like a really odd object from my entertainer's pack on the ground, see whether we're just repeating the same place, the same corridor thing, you know? I'm, uh, I need to check what's in my entertainer's pack, give me a minute. We're going down a creepy stairway, just for hours now? Uh, hallway, though it does have a slight decline. <laughs> I, I have two costumes, so I will leave the costume of a bunny rabbit on the ground. Just leaving it there. I'm not sure why you have a dwarf-sized bunny rabbit costume, but I'm not one to judge. I'm leaving a bunny costume on the ground. I have one more costume, but I'm not going to tell you what that is. I could help out here. I've got some ball bearings. I'm going to just roll a few and see if... No, they don't seem to roll back. Well, now we have to be on the watch for ball bearings in the future. Well, shit. Let's keep moving, shall we? Over the next hour, the walls became gradually more minimal, showing evidence of previous collapse and renovations. Every so often, a mild tremor reverberated throughout the passage, but despite the light rain of dust, it still felt generally safe. Okay, I I know we're all getting pretty worn down, but do not lack on your observations. We are in hostile territory right now. Look out for traps, the SO, and the nameless G. I I mean the NG. Can anyone see any more of those runes on the walls at all? Any inscriptions, any blood, any... thing? No, it's incredibly bare. From up here, the only thing I can... Ah, well, maybe Father Westpike is a psychic, because there is a brief section up ahead where I think I can see stairs being introduced. Steps to accommodate the increasingly noticeable decline. We've been awake, what, seven hours? What's the worst that stairs can do? I think we should rest. In the stairway? Well, if anything comes at us again, it can only come from two directions. That is a good point. Uh... I would like to be fully rested, but we are now beyond the gate. The time is moving at a normal pace now. We do not have much time to waste. Wait, hold up. I think the little canary Lady Cavern's fall gave me is trying to say something. I feel movement. Okay. Siggy, Siggy, can you hear me? What do you have for me? Uh, I'm going to lean in and listen. Better not attack me. Mm. Time flows different. Ah, no. Westpike, you're wrong. Time is slower for us now that we've passed the next gate, and it's even slower for those who are further ahead, so it sort of all evens out in the end. Witnessing their faithless companion speak to a dead bird, the team's sanity was tested. Was this truly Ayas Inskeep? And if it was, was he becoming unhinged? All who failed took ten stress damage. I've spoken to a sword yesterday, I'm not worried. Yeah, me too. Natural 20. Uh, 16. Normal enough for me. Well, talking to animals is fairly normal to me. It's dead, though. It's not living. I don't need to roll one since I'm pretty sure I'm hearing this. Well, I got a ten. I'm pretty sure it's Ayas. I got a four. Uh, I guess I forgot that the bird was dead. Uh, and now I'm over 50 stress. Oh, my God. Well, we will certainly want to rest then, if time allows it. I don't see the reason for um, the way we should stop right now. I mean, no one seems to be out of magic, right? No one's massively hurt because of your spell earlier. We should keep going on. Just, this is so boring. Yeah. The tracks did take its toll. I fear that it may... I fear that exhaustion may become a problem later. It did hit me quite hard yesterday, and I barely got enough sleep last night with, and I look at Fligia, constant distractions. Uh, Me! Uh, I would like to have a quick chat with whatever his name is. Old Skags. One second. All right. Uh, Siggy, Siggy, do you know anything else about what's going on down here? What do we need to do? Follow the path. Well, yeah, of course. But do you know any hints? One foot after the other. Oh, great. My sense of humour has affected this dead bird. Are you talking to the bird? (sighs) What an unnatural thing, an abomination. It should not be left to live. You can make the journey in what feels like three days of travel. Three days to go before what? Before you reach... Right, apparently we've got three days before we get to the children. We've got enough food. 
No, I do. Oh, sorry. I forgot to tell you this because we were... There was a bit of chaos. I stole Frigia's trail rations. Lady Cavernfall's trail rations. Okay. And I did not steal them. I, I politely took them away because, well, they're going to rot anyway. How many are there? There were exactly three in her backpack, so I have four now. Perfect. Now we won't have to eat the children. <laughs> uh, why are you all... Uh, no, that was a joke. Yeah... Do we still have those manacles? Sorry, uh, I just realised when he asked about food last night, I never brought this up. Apparently I had I, I have five of my entertainers packed, so I think we're good. So I have four left. Mm. So, wait, so the bird told you we have... The bird said that we've got three days until we find the one I seek, which I'm assuming is my son, so... Mm. Then shall we push on a little bit further, maybe until we reach another door, and then take a break? Okay. Please watch for the ball bearings. I actually see them. They stopped just before the stairs, just kind of sitting near a crack in the wall. I point at them for whoever's in the front, just like, uh, don't, don't, what's up? I'll pick him up and stick him back in my pocket. The team descended the staircase slowly for 40 minutes until the steps faded to an even surface that continued at a noticeable downward gradient. As they continued to walk, Soren spotted a superficial archway, an embellishment of the passage. It didn't feel particularly out of place. Now, uh, didn't someone say that when things go through arches, things change? Uh, I am assuming that that meant the, the original arch, the one we passed through and then got attacked by the big slicey sword thing. Maybe we ought to check to see if there are any runes or anything on it. Uh, I got a 16. Uh, it appears to be empty, there's no trap, and it's really bare. Uh, it's got some rooms in it, but in again, they're in like the old draconic. I'll give it a go with a wee bit of a translation for a few moments. No, it's a bit beyond me. I can't quite understand it, but I can tell you, it doesn't have any inherent, you know, strangeness about it. Well, context really, but no real strangeness. Uh, with a few hours here, I could probably get a wee bit more done, but I think we're in a bit of a rush. So, I mean, I don't really read draconic all that well, but. It doesn't seem magical or anything, if that's what you're really asking. Then shall we make camp here before the archway? Just in case it is magical. Yes, I'm all for resting. M- my feet are killing me. <laughs> I would actually quite like you know, talking to the bird. I would just like to know for sure about the arches, whether time flows differently before each arch or after each arch, seeing as we got to another arch. The destination is the same either way. Existential satnav. Gotta love it. Nah, let's keep going a bit. My son's in danger. I'd also like to continue a bit more before we rest. Three to two. We're not resting just yet. Now let's get going. For the next three hours of travel, the tunnel walls were partially hidden behind scaffolding. Limestone could be seen behind the stacked stones of the tunnel, and all of the wood sat in a sad state of disrepair, either due to rot or another form of decomposition. Two more hours into the distance, Soren made the party aware of another superficial archway. Sorry, we don't have time to research the archways. I don't like it, but we need to press on. The team continued past. During the next hour, they noted entire sections of wall that were incomplete, or perhaps intended to accommodate safe travel into long-forgotten passages. But the trail of the children remained on the main path. The party also began to realize that they were shivering from time to time now, as the passage had gotten noticeably more cold. And with an additional hour gone, Soren pointed out another superficial archway. At this point we've been awake for, what, 14, 15 hours? Yep, something like that. Father Westpike, at this point, puts his hands up. No, no, we need to rest. Yep, I agree. Let's rest already. I am sorry. I, 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 too, do want to reach the destination as soon as we can, but we cannot get there exhumed. Uh, exhausted. And we have no idea what lies ahead. Before we exhaust ourselves, I'll be the third vote for a long rest. This part of the passage, well, it's an ideal location. Uh, thank the gods. Who's gonna take the, uh, the watch? I'll take first watch. Okay, I take... I take first watch with you. Vilgia and Ias both needed to make constitution saving throws to stay awake. Twenty! Thirteen. And while they sat back to back, each watching one direction of the passage, what were they doing to stay awake? I'm doing the journaling thing again, and glancing over at Yowza's bird whenever I can steal a glance. Uh, 
that abomination must be put to rest. I'm going to spend some of my time partly making sure to kick Lady of Bunnies just to make sure that she doesn't fall asleep or get too lost into her journals. But I'm also... I'm quite interested by this uh, by this mechanical canary still. Hey, Bunny Witch, what's with the book? I write down everything that we've been through. It's a journal. Interesting. Considering how shitty of a day it's been, I think Mr. Trumple fucking will probably make for better conversation. As Aya spoke with the existential canary and Filgia updated her journal, they both needed to make perception checks on their watch, representing their efforts to remain actively focused on their surroundings. Sixteen. Twenty! While Filgia was journaling, she noticed a curious seam on the wall next to her. What the fuck's that? Lydia, what are you doing? Another bathroom break. There seems to be a seam, like a crack, in one of the massive stones. I- I'm trying to follow the seam with my finger and assess how big it is, where where it's leading to. It's uh, it's door sized and rectangular, I think. It seems to be intentional. All right, yeah. I'm not sure how I didn't notice that. I generally have pretty good perception. What do you think? Should I push it a little bit? Should we try to see if it moves at all? Yeah, why not? Okay, let's see where you lead to. Filgia required a dexterity saving throw. Nine. (gasps) Fuck! As Filgia pushed the stone, she fell through as if there were no stone at all. The gray surface of the ten-foot stone rippled briefly as she fell through. Aias rushed to grab onto her, but he wasn't fast enough and only succeeded in jamming his hand through the ripples of the rock before they solidified once more. He found his hands now stuck in solid rock. Oh, fuck. My hand's in the wall. It's it's like a one-way extra-dimensional passage. And it's totally an awkward moment when my feet are on either side of the wall and I'm trying to pull my hand out. Anyone watching would probably make fun of this because Ias's tail was also at the ready. I am going to use my tail to prod Rowena because she seems to have good ideas. Oi, me. Just want to sleep. Because I know you've got a grumpy, grumpy cousin who's... All right, I'll get up. Oh! What the fuck? Your arm stuck in the wall! Yeah, I know. Well, all does this may sound, this isn't actually the first time I've seen this happen. Have you tried letting go of whatever it is you're holding on to? Somewhere, far away, Filgia fell through the darkness before landing in a small room. Her dark vision quickly adjusted, and she could see a small room with a single exit up ahead. Is Yao's hand still stuck somewhere on me? Uh, no. Whew. Well, at least I'm all here. So, time to move on. Eh. Oh, damn. My staff is back with the others. Uh. Filgia followed the narrow hallway ahead of her, discerning a number of tall, flat objects ahead. Possibly glass? Filgia could see a glint up ahead, the feral glow from a pair of eyes. Intelligent. Cunning. Dangerous. And at roughly the height of her own eye level. For a brief moment, Filgia braced herself to attack before realizing that the eyes were her own. The room, it seemed, was filled with mirrors. You know what? I light a torch. Yes, the torch allowed her to see so much more detail. It was definitely a narrow hallway made of glass and mirrors. As she took a few steps closer, she could hear her own voice off in the distance. What is this? Another trick? And this is my own voice? I don't trust it. Who's there? The fuck? If you're the silent one or whatever, I don't have time for your bullshit. I just fell through a rock wall. I need to get back to the others before they wake up, so kindly get out of my way before I make this into a flame blade. Uh, am I just completely surrounded by mirrors, or is this just like a, a like a hallway with mirrors? Filgia had entered a wide hallway with numerous mirrors in it, and behind her was a dead end, a room of bare dirt and stone. No indication of how she'd arrived there in the first place. I guess I'm just gonna try to move forward? Filgia continued quietly for a minute as she cautiously passed the hallway into the entrance of the large room with rows of mirrors, each reflecting the light in her hand and terrified expression on her face. Up ahead, she could see a torchlight approaching the far end through a similarly narrow passage. I stand still and wait until the torchlight approaches? It stood still as well, its holder just out of view due to the rows of mirrors. Is that a reflection, I wonder? If you're not the silent one, this lends way to many, many other questions. 
I'm going to walk around this mirror and by the all shadow. If you look like me, I'm going to... Filgia walked in sync with the bearer of the other torch around the large room. The room was perhaps 60 feet in size with a 10 foot tall ceiling. Rows and rows of mirrors with gaps interspersed were the only defining features between the glass floor and the ceiling. I try to move along the hallway, along the side of the hall, in a circular way around it, and, and see and, and watch the other torch, see where it's going. Slowly, cautiously, Filgia took timid steps through the maze of mirrors, following the far wall, shattering any mirrors that blocked her path with her dagger. The light of the other torch seemed to make the same pattern, taking the same wall. After breaking her third mirror, she looked ahead and was horrified to realize that the reflection standing thirty feet away from her was not contained within any mirror. The holder of the other torch was a perfect mirrored likeness of Filgia. Filgia, having heard such things in Tales of Ferrati and the All Shadow, passed her sanity saving throw and took a few bold steps forward. I ask again, who are you? I asked you first! Trying to look like me, obviously, won't fool me into thinking that you are not the silent one. So clearly you must be something else. Not a doppelganger. Not an illusion. So what exactly are you? I try to get closer. Both figures stepped forward cautiously, yet meeting the fierce, inquisitive gaze of the other. A mere fifteen feet apart, things felt very uncomfortable. Each watched the other breathe with strange fascination turned their bodies slightly, and stared longer yet. They both checked for illusion and alteration magic, but none were present, and no mirror separated them. I raise my hand. Both Filgias raised the same hand simultaneously, and as the other's tail reached for a dagger, Filgia found herself unconsciously reaching for hers. I did not initiate that move, because you are not evil. I understand now. I cannot let you leave this place alive. <laughs> At least we can agree on something then. <laughs> Both Filgias stood, each holding a dagger. A coin toss from the player would decide which one would be the victor over the coming conflict. Heads or tails? Heads. Thirty seconds later, the battered and bruised Filgia violently slammed the skull of her twin into the ground, using her tail to pin it on his arm. She stabbed the grappled Filgia's torso with her flaming sword. As she leaned in closer, watching the focus, the life, leave her twin's eyes, she had to be sure. Good prevailed on this day, and as her twin died, the floor and the room around her shattered. Having murdered a version of herself, even one that was evil, Filgia now had to make a sanity saving throw. Uh, a one, critical failure. And she took the full 40 stress damage, pushing her past the breaking point. As she cackled, she told herself the creature she killed couldn't have been the same as her. Couldn't have been anything like her. Couldn't have been identical in every way except a murderous moral alignment. Calling to sacrifice the living in the name of the All Shadow. Had to be a mistake. But Filgia had little time to ponder this. As she fell through the ceiling just beyond the light of the fire where her allies slept. And where Ayas and Rowena were standing near a block of stone, seemingly still perplexed. Is your arm almost out of the wall yet? You're somehow making this terrifying moment very embarrassing. I need to tell you something about Fligy- Whoa! Oh, blame me. See, I told you we'd have you out of there. No. next time you get your arm stuck in the wall, you better call me again. I'm the fucking best when arms are stuck through walls. Just ask my second cousin twice removed, I mean. I want to confirm this. You guys did not wake me up intentionally. Yeah? No, I didn't. I didn't. I, the only person I woke up was Rowena because I thought there is no way I'm going to wake you up because I don't want the religious grumpy man speech. And you need to get your sleep, cousin. I mean, you're talking about, like, being exhausted and whatnot, so, you know, I have to let you sleep. You know, beauty and all that. Hi, I'm back. Oh, hi. Uh, where did you run off to? And what the hell happened to your uh, your face and oh, your arm? Hey, Vilgia's back. I got into a fight with some rats. I'm fine. Go back to bed. Cool. Back to slumberland. Sounds like they were pretty big rats. Oh. Not really. It was more that I hurt myself while trying to hurt them. Uh, let's not dwell on it. Really, please. As hilarious as this sounds, okay, and I'll cut up in a ball, a very little ball next to my cousin. I'm glad you're okay. 
So, what happened? Where'd it lead? An empty room. Uh, it was dark and there were a lot of rats, but I killed them all, so we should be fine. Okay then, good enough for me. Glad you're okay. I guess we've got the rest of our watch to still go. About another hour and a half left. I'll sit down near my sleeping bag and watch the Lady of Bunnies doing her journaling, kicking her, making sure that we're all still okay and yeah. I'm going to be leaning on the different wall now, not the original. Yeah, smart thinking that. I'm staying away from that one. Yeah, but we're still, uh, we still need to be positioned so we can look down the corridors, making sure there's nothing coming. Okay, I'll sit next to you and read my journal and write in there about the things I found in the wall. And I just get up to walk around sometimes to stretch my legs. Uh, at some point I just stand in front of the wall that was sucking me in and I'm just staring at it, pondering. Filkia did exactly that but eventually returned to her seat next to Ayas to journal a bit more. Scribbling harshly, she passed a note to the DM. She began to speak in a whisper, almost as if reading aloud what she wrote, when suddenly the staff in her hand shifted, reforming into a flame sword. Bring forth the primal flames. What? Ah! I rolled a 17, plus a bunch of stuff, to stab Yowls. (laughs) <laughs> Me? So it would appear. Okay, I'm calling bullshit and using my inspiration to force Phlegia to re-roll her attack. As I <clears throat> saw a vision of his heart being run through, his body immolated by the immense heat of Philgia's blade, the very hands of fate seemed to intervene and prevent his demise. And would you mind re-rolling the attack, Philgia? Natural 20, a critical hit. Well, fuck. Yep, that's so much worse. 85 on a critical hit charge, and 12 damage. The blade did not kill Ias in a single swipe, but instead caught him in the stomach, sealing the wound instantly as he pulled away to disengage and regroup. Ias put the sleeping Father West Pike between them as he pulled his own weapons, a matching dagger and rapier. What the hell are you doing? Let's not be rash. Smiling wickedly, Filgia moved to attack again, striking <laughs> Ias' left arm, nearly severing it. Go, wake up! She's gone mad and just started stabbing me. Fuck, I'm down to four health points. Someone wake up and do something! Ias disengaged again and propped Father Westpike up as a human shield, just as Soren Arkwright awoke. So, uh, I see two party members fighting, and uh, I'm not sure why. Yeah, I, I, I haven't actually raised anything, except these blades in a defense pattern. I, uh, I'm just, I'm still being nice, just disengaging all the time. He has a sword and a dagger out, and he's been burned and cut pretty severely by wounds matching Filgia's flaming sword. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying not to do anything related to smiting, because we know how that goes. What if I, just for fun, in a a sleep stupor, I wake up and immediately throw my flask of holy water onto Filgia, distraction style? The vial struck Filgia in the head before shattering and dousing her in holy water from the Church of Torm. Not on me, you idiot! He's the doppler! I'm sorry! Kill him, not me! Seeing the wounds that Filgia herself had recently sustained, Soren moved to grapple Ayas, not in a way that would hurt him but merely as a means to restrain him. I'm sorry about this. He did so with an opposed strength check at disadvantage. But despite this, Ayas was restrained by Soren. Rowena awoke at that time to the sound of laughter. No, no, look, look, maniacal laughter, maniacal. Seeing that that Soren has won, and uh, I'd grapple her, but she has a flaming sword, so fuck that. Um, I'm just going to look up and just start, like, whispering under my breath. Don't be scared. Don't shed a tear. It won't be a problem if you weren't here. And I'm going to cast Dissonant Whispers at her. Dizzying, Dissonant Whispers began to take hold of Rafilkia's mind, but her wisdom overcame the challenge. Still, she took six psychic damage, even as the headache began to wear away slowly. Wake up, sleepyhead, do something, because you're not dead. And I'll give bardic inspiration to my cousin. Okay, so I was woken up by screaming, then propped up sort of like a hostage, and as Ayas' hands are clasped behind his back, I almost fall on my ass. I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask a little bit of a gaming question. Can I make an educated guess on what is wrong with the one that was manically laughing and then got really upset when holy water was thrown on hers? I just didn't like getting wet and laughter is how I relieve stress. I stress love. (laughs) See? I'm doing it now. 
she does not appear to be under any charm effects. She appears to be a soundish of mind and of her own accord. All right, then it's a second choice. I tackle her. Twenty! Father Westpike moved to pin her down, using his slightly above-average dwarven height and body weight. But despite his limp and old age, he was able to restrain her, forcing her to drop her blade, which returned to the form of a staff as it hit the ground. I'm not the enemy here! No! She went through a wall and then she... She what? Well, then she came back. She disappeared through that wall over there. Rowena yeah, can... And then she appeared on you from the ceiling. Yeah. You were there for this? When did this happen? Oh, uh, you're asleep. Don't worry about it. I'm going to meander over to Ayas. <laughs> I'm going to put my hand on his shoulder. It's like, um, uh, your wounds, I'm going to heal. All your wounds are now going to be steel. And then I'll give you a level two cure wounds because, fuck mine, you're almost dead. What? What does that even mean? It means I'm going to give you some hit points. Oh, cool. I will just be hugging throughout this exchange. Basically, I let, I let go of Filka and like, push her away from Ayas as I look back to Ayas's. And then she just went... She she pulled out a sword and I, she hit me and stuff. And each time I disengaged, trying to make sure that... Well, just trying to find out what was going on. And then she they, she just kept coming at me. Don't listen to him. He's the Doppler. He was trying to kill me. He had a rapier in his hand. I was defending myself. You attacked me first. Oh, yeah? And where are your wounds, then? I dodged it. I'm going to insight her. Look really close yet to see if she's lying. Because he's beaten to crap. Well, fuck, she's actually kind of believable, covered in those bruises from the rats. But she's not got a stab mark on her that matches my blades. You could just be a really crap assassin. (laughs) If only you knew. That didn't stop you from trying! (laughs) See? You're making me nervous cackle again. (laughs) I I look to Soren, kind of confused, like, do you have any idea what's going on? He's just nuzzling eyes. It's not much... Not much happening there. Uh, why Why do you think he's a doppler? Because he tried to attack me. Just what's the last thing you remember before we were all embroiled in combat here? Who? Me or her? Filga. Why did I stab him with the flame sword? Just before that, yeah. What What started this? I don't know. I, I was just writing into my my journal and suddenly I, I see Yao smile at me all funny like he has his rapier out and tried to stab me. Wait, wait. We've all been tricked by the... S.O. and N.O. Do you think maybe this was a trick on you? I suppose it might have been. I have also had my mind scrambled by the silent one less than a day ago. Because I'm pretty good at reading most people and I'm pretty sure you're telling the truth but I'm also pretty sure you're not a Doppler because, well, yeah, you were really properly beaten and you're bleeding normal so are you sure you weren't tricked? She disappeared through the wall, and then she reappeared. You were there. You saw her reappear from the ceiling. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not disputing that. But maybe she was tricked into attacking you, like when you cast the thunder wave at everyone, and that that thing wasn't real. What What happened in the wall? Where did you go? I don't know. I just stepped into the wall, and then it was black for just a moment, and there were rats. <sighs> then suddenly, I was back here. I can't remember much beyond that, and 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 fighting the rats, of course. Fear that Filka may be under some kind of mind magic, uh, since I I have seen uh, Ayas fight, and I highly doubt that, given the opportunity to strike first, he would miss. Thank you. Okay, so let's go with everyone is normal, everyone is themselves, and this is just another one of those tricks. Okay. Well, you keep her away from me. I can take shift with Filka. Don't worry. Well, you two have only got an hour to go, right? So we'll take over the watch from here. Hmm. That's... that's approvable. And yeah, I guess we're taking a longer watch. Now everyone go to bed. Okay, we need to rest because there's no telling what we must face at the end of this tunnel. The team dispersed, each going back to their sleeping accommodations. Ayas, far away from Filgia, and Soren playing quietly with a dagger for a few minutes before sleep finally took him. The cousins were now on watch. But what were they doing as the minutes rolled by? I'll keep a very close eye on Fligia, since she's the one that went through a magical portal and had no wounds from Ayas. Right, I'll watch Soren. I'm still not entirely sure that he's in control of himself. I'll also keep an eye on... on Ayas. An eye on Ayas. If we, like, sit in the middle of the corridor and one of us looks one way and the other looks to the back the other way, and we can just look at each other and keep each other awake, that, that should be fine, right? I think that's a that's an okay idea. I'm assuming that we will have very minimal conversations then, since we're speaking over the sleeping people. A quiet watch it is then. 
Both members of the watch were required to make constitution saving throws to remain awake. All right. Baby. 20. 12. And so it was that the next watch went without incident. A few hours passed, and it was time to change watch. But who among them could be trusted? You go back to sleep, I'll, I'll sit over Soren. And then you won't have rested enough. I'm okay, I'm... You know, I, I slept pretty well yesterday, and, you know, I'm not too bad on hit points enough. None of us slept well yesterday. Don't lie to me. Uh, she kind of does a half-embarrassed smile thing. Like, All right, so you called me out, but you need to sleep more than I do. You're a... I can deal with it, don't worry. Get your sleep. I'll take us what's with Soren. No, if it becomes a battle of wills, you know I'm going to win, right? I, I, I know I can't beat you in a battle of wills, but I'm pretty sure I can still pin you down and tie you to your bedroll. Go to sleep. Uh, no. You remember I'm, like, stronger than you. I see what's happening here, but there's plenty of me to go around. Let's not fight. I'd throw something at Soren. Rowena threw a small piece of bread at Soren, who quickly caught it and ate it in the coming minutes. You get the first two hours, I get the second two hours. Okay, that's fair. Now go to bed. I crawl up into my bedroom. Soren then required a constitution saving throw to see how focused and awake he remained during his watch. Sure thing. Uh, 17. Soren had no difficulty maintaining his vigilance while silently shaving his face with his cursed dagger. Blood occasionally dripped from the blade, but no marks appeared on his skin. And for the rest of the watch, he held the dagger closely, examining it and re-examining it. During the rest... The team was able to fully recover, except for Father Westpike and Rowena, who did not get a full rest. That's fine. Does that mean I get my hit points back, or do they stay where they are? He did. Reluctantly aided by the magics of Father Westpike, Ias's crippled arm recovered swiftly. Thanks. As the team regrouped and ate a silent meal, Rowena took only a single bite before spitting the food out, disgusted. As they finished eating, they stood up one by one and continued down the dark passage. Another hour of travel passed, and the tunnel was clearly sloping downward again, though little else seemed to change. A few minutes more, and the team was about to pass through another superficial archway. Are we passing the same archway every time, or is the the walls changing? They are slightly different. It is different. All right, I make a slight mark at the archway, somewhere where I won't disturb the symbols that have been written onto it. Father Westpike lingered beneath the archway to make a mark. As a mass of green fell atop it, ah! requiring a dexterity saving throw. Yeah, that's a seven. As the slime landed on his shoulder, it seemed ah! to eat into him, hissing and bubbling like acid, burning his skin ah! for six damage. Ah! Father Westpike flailed and tried to push the acidic slime off his body, his arm succeeding in removing it from his shoulder, but the residual acid burning through his gloves and armor for another six damage. Remnants of the thick, hissing slime continued to eat away at his flesh, exposing areas of red across his shoulders, arms, and hands. Uh, here made a uh, level headed, even at the sight of his own skin being eaten away. God damn! I'm gonna put my hand on where this goo is. I'm gonna cast Predestination to clean this crap off him. Uh, uh, thank you, Rowena. I've seen these things before in the crack. They are not too great a threat, but they can be quite damaging, as you've just seen. Father Westpike began to bandage his hands and shoulder as Filkia and Soren examined the green slime near their feet. I've done this many times before. I've, I've encountered these things before. Don't worry. Practice. So, let me get this right. You've burnt your hands every single time that this stuff has fallen on you. What else are you supposed to do? Let it be, burn you? Well, you could clean it off like I just did. And not everyone went what to... Was, what did you do before I turned up? Used my hands? Wait, that could be taken wrong. All right, let's let's skip past that awkward conversation and walk on. I quietly cast uh, cure wounds on myself, uh, shamefully. There's no, you cannot recover. It's like necrotic damage. You can't recover pride. It's uh, it's gone. Soren, if you would, please continue. Another hour of travel and the construction in stones gave way to a natural limestone wall, which formed a natural passageway, which followed the team's descent deeper into the earth. As they followed the trail of their quarry, the missing children, a small red light flickered far in the distance from one of the side passages before vanishing. This event was marked by a brief tremor. Thankfully, the passage appears to be stable. For now. The team continued, and after traveling for two more hours down the dark, featureless cavern, Father Westpike alone noticed that the walls were no longer limestone, but a sort of thick, glistening gray which appeared to undulate and move away from the heat of the torches. Um, so I wasn't going to say anything, but, uh... Yes? Please stop a moment. 
This isn't a type of wood or granite. It's... Coming to the very quick realization of his situation, Father Westpike's sanity was tested and found lacking. He took 15 stress damage as he swiped the torch from Soren and began shaking with a physical manifestation of fear. All right, everybody, just don't, don't, don't panic. Stay in a single fold line and do not, for the love of everything that is holy, do not touch the wall. Uh, are you okay? What's going on? He could not bring himself to name what he'd seen, for fear of it becoming suddenly more real than it already was. The walls will kill you if you touch them, Rowena. I look at the wall. I look back at him, like, um... Okay, I promise not... The walls do strange things around here, I can tell you that. No, no. Okay. No, no, they will. People disappear into them and then come back as murderers. Are you not, are you not listening to me? Yeah. No, 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 it's okay. Look, 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 Father, it's okay. Uh, we'll promise not to touch the walls. We'll, um, just don't worry about it. I mean, you said don't touch the walls. We're not touching the walls. We're just going to keep walking forward. It's okay. And I'll, like, put my arm through his and take the torch. No, I hold the torch. Rowena lit a second torch quietly trying to remain calm and collected before her uninjured cousin. Yes, yes. Smart thinking. More is better. We all need need the torch. Well, we're all going to have torches. It's fine, right, guys? Sure. Yeah, see? Torch. If we're not going to stop here, we better get somebody, somewhere else and then stop. But we can't just stand here and keep talking. An hour of travel. The six adventurers, walking in single file, slowly became aware of a wet squelching sound just barely audible all around them. After an hour of hearing it, team's concerns lessened, as if it was something natural, something that always was. I look around, make sure we're still walking in a single file line and nobody's straggling closer to the walls than they should. I I often snap at people when they, like, take a little step out of line. Hold up. Did did you see that? See what? I I saw something. A grey ooze. It was picking something up off the path here before merging into the... Wall. We're surrounded. There's no passage anymore, just ooze in every direction, moving just out of the torchlight with every step we seem to take. It is like the stone itself is breathing. As the rest of the team realized what had set Father Westpike off, their resolves were tested. But one by one, they passed, sturdy and focused, willing to do whatever it took to get as far away from this place as possible. We, we have to keep going. All right, the passage ahead is still spacious by most standards, but it's a bit more narrow than we've been used to. We're going to have to get uncomfortably close to the ooze walls in another 20 feet or so. Before we do this, I need to focus my primal awareness to ensure that we're not ambushed. This would probably make a perfect point of attack. Soren stood there silently as the others could only fidget quietly in the darkness behind him. As he opened his awareness... Using magics to expand his mind, he could feel the presence of the following creatures within six miles. Infernals, aberrations, fey, and undead. Soren, could you please hurry it up over there? Some of us back here are- <clears throat> At the back of the group, Sister Cavern's Fall struck Ias with a wickedly barbed staff for seven bludgeoning damage. Hearing the start of combat, Soren immediately turned around, locked eyes with Sister Cavern's Fall, and threw both of his daggers at her. One missing, one finding its home in her shoulder, <laughs> sinking Ow. into the artery. <laughs> I'm using the daggers. Come full circle. I mistake you. Ik hellish rebuke. As Sister Cavern's false eyes glowed with hate, Soren could feel a heat erupting from beneath him. He was only just barely able to scramble away in time, taking only half of the 18 damage in the process as the purple flames singed his left side. Yeah, that didn't feel good. Quick head count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, feck. You do matter. I'll cast shuttle. Rowena saw Sister Caverns fall and immediately cast Shack and her target, so that the thunderous effect would not hurt Ayas. But she overshot her distance, only partially hitting her target for 11 damage, clearly damaging Sister Caverns fall, who appeared winded but whose face still betrayed a hateful glare. As the deafeningly loud crash echoed and reverberated, a dim silence returned, noticeably lacking the wet smacking noises that had surrounded the team. The walls had stopped moving. Bonus action, I'm going to give a uh, bardic inspiration to Soren. Soren, all you got to do is keep trying and just try and make sure that whatever you do, you don't die. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm going to bring the crossbow back out again because that's the last time I've been 
I'm going to be attacked by someone. I know, I noticed that it was Hellish Rebuke, and I'm thinking only a tiefling can do Hellish Rebuke. Ayas dropped his torch and pulled up his crossbow, staring hard into Sister Cavern's Fall's eyes and finding something familiar about the expression. Goodbye, sister. He pulled the trigger. As she still prepared her counterattack against Rowena, Ayas' shot rang true, catching Sister Cavern's Fall's forehead just above the brow. Her eyes rolled up as her form began to shift becoming a duplicate of Filgia, who still stood between Ayas and Father Westpike, a look of surprise and shock clear across her face. Already beyond the breaking point, Filgia (laughs) cackled nervously as the Doppler before the team collapsed in front of them, unconscious, presumably dying. Fuck. She'd better be dying there. Father Westpike and Soren also failed their sanity-saving throws. And as the deadly silence continued, Father Westpike stood in silent shock, unable to act or speak. After a considerable amount of effort, Father Westpike slowly stumbled forward, trying to put himself between the team and the fallen Filgia. Soren found himself caressing the bloody dagger he'd thrown just moments ago, glancing carefully from Filgia to the unconscious Filgia, and back again, the dagger called out for more blood. Everyone, just stay back, everyone. Stay back a moment. I'm going to heal Ayas. Morgan Guð, blessaðu sár þar þessar mann svo haltu okkur þar til við getum fundið út hvað er í gangi á nefnilegginu. Eleven! Thanks. The standing Filgia held onto her sacrificial dagger, gripping it tightly. I... I... <laughs> I don't know what that was. That... that must have been a Doppler. <laughs> I don't know what's happened. <laughs> uh, why... why... why did I... Did I... Why did it take the form of Sister Cavern's fall? Do you think this is the silent... What happened when you went through the wall? <laughs> I, I told you. I told you. I don't know. It was... It was just suddenly black and then I... I just suddenly found myself falling from the ceiling again. And then I was back with you guys. I don't know what happened in between. You mentioned rats before. I just don't know anymore. This place, it it does things to you, to your memory. I'm doing a head count. Even though it's dumb at this point, I as Fligia, dying Fligia, myself and I already said Rowena that one time, just the one, Serin. That's it, just the five of us. Fligia on the ground, she might. I'm going to look for her diary. Father Westpike began to approach the downed Filgia, one hand on his torch. He began to move her cloak away and search for the journal, when the sound of wet movement just beyond the light of his torch caused him to glance up just in time to see a large, dark shape rushing toward him. He only had enough time to drop the torch and stagger back as the shapeless form landed with a squelch atop the body of Filgia, who began to immediately bubble and disintegrate somewhere underneath the thick, crimson ooze. Still paralyzed in shock and fear, Father Westpike was prone and helpless to react as the shapeless form moved to overtake him. Watch out! Soren swung his torch toward the monstrosity and pulled Father Westpike to his feet. But the thing quickly formed around the path of the torch, avoiding the strike. As it moved, the bones and flesh of a grinning withered face beneath the ooze became temporarily visible, before sinking back again beneath the red, wriggling mass. (laughs) <laughs> These things don't like fire. Thank you. Rowena, quick to her cousin's aid, cast vicious mockery at the creature. She's just going to look at it and say, I'm not scared of you, you're just a giant ooze. The ooze, unable to understand Rowena, was unfazed by the magic within her words. And eat steel. I stabbed the quivering ooze with his rapier, seemingly damaging it. But as his sword pierced its surface, an arterial spray of red semi its slime splashed back for three damage, partially burning his face and sword arm, weakening his blade, permanently reducing its effectiveness by one as the acid began to pit the steel. Ayas quickly dashed back, disengaging from the monstrosity. Only ranged weapons! Do not touch it with your own! Coming to his senses, Father Westpike began to push the line back away from the fiend. Filgia, still in a terrified state, was unable to act, but gladly followed his lead. We should destroy it if anybody can! Father Westpike fumbled as he tried to pull his crossbow, but instead Soren passed him the lit torch while notching an arrow with his bow. Hold this. Get down. Soren fired the shot into the central mass of the pulsating ooze, the arrow impacting and popping the dermis like a boil for 15 damage, a thick, runny liquid now trailing down its side. A second shot trailed behind from Rowena, causing an additional six damage from her hand crossbow. And just like that, 
creature changed course, retreating back into the darkness, the wet slimy sounds of the cave having returned to greet them. Uh, pass me the torch. The ooze ahead of us isn't moving. Here. Ayas, yes, can you can I see your sword? I'm proficient with smithing tools. I could maybe patch it up. Yeah, thanks. You can, but not when we're in the hallway of ooze. With a big crimson ooze lurking somewhere just beyond the torchlight. All right, gotcha. Bad idea. Well, then, I don't know if that sword is sentimental to you, but I can probably patch it up next time we take a break. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks. Good news. We can keep moving. The ooze hates fire more than it wants to keep us here. Thank the gods. I, I couldn't fight it. I just couldn't. By the way, how are you doing? I saw you took quite a beating from the doppelganger. Yeah, just a few scratches after your last bit of healing. I've seen worse. All right, all right. Do you think you need some patching up, or do you want to push on? I'm good to push on for now. Great to hear that. You are a good man, Ayas. At least I would like to believe so. We will find your son. Thanks. I appreciate your concern for once. I want us to get out of this hallway as soon as we can. These walls literally want us dead. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind moving a little bit faster, Soren, that would be grand. And so the team continued through the cavern of ooze, praying to their respective gods to see an end to the tunnel, and not find themselves prey to the crimson ooze. Dark Dice, Chapter 9, Tunnels. Starring Caitlin Statz as Sister Savorite Caverns Fall, David Alt as Ayas Inskeep, Peter Lewis as Soren Arkwright, Ethor Vithyarsen as Father Sindri Westpike, Cassie Rulinicki as Philgia the Witch, Hem Cleveland as Lady Rowena Granitepike, and Travis Vengroff as the Dungeon Master, with transcriptions by Hem Cleveland. This episode was co-edited by Sarah Baczynski and Marissa Ewing, produced with sound design by Travis Vengroff, and mixed and mastered by Marissa Ewing. This episode featured music by Travis Vengroff, Sam Bose Miller, Stephen Malin, and showcased the Budapest Scoring Choir and Enzo Pizzovio. To support this presentation, gain access to bonus episodes, music, and an early copy of the adventure, including transcription, artwork, and more, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash libertypodcast. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at Dark Dice Pod. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening.